How's it going everyone? Welcome to the next episode of Pathagonia. So I'm getting ready to start my cytology rotation in a week or so. So I thought today I'd do a little bit of a review of some cytology basics and this is based on Kurt's notes. So if those of you are unfamiliar with Kurt's notes, um, it's a free resource online for pathology residents or really anyone interested in learning more about pathology. It's an excellent resource and I'm going to add the link to Kurt's notes uh, in the comment section of this video and be sure to check it out. Um, again, none of this was made by me but just an excellent resource and I wanted to review it for my own knowledge and then hopefully someone else can watch this video and get something out of it also. So. Cytology, what is it? We are really just assessing cells, right? That's pathology in general. We're looking at cells, looking to see what's benign, what's malignant. And cytology really gets into the analysis of individual cells. So on the left, we have features that are gonna be common to benign cells. And then on the right, um, we have features that'll be common in malignant cells. So on the left, some benign features, we're going to have round nuclei. You can see our round nuclei here with a smooth, even, evenly distributed chromatin. So you can see it's evenly distributed here and it's not all clumpy like it is in the malignant cell. So the benign entities, one approach that he talks about is dividing the nucleus into quarters and then comparing the chromatin and the nuclear contours of each quarter. So let's say we look at the superficial cell here and we divide it into quarters. For the most part, the chromatin is similar in color, texture, etc., and same with the nucleus. However, if we divide this cell or try to, you can see more, there's more irregularities in the different quarters or the different sectors. Um, so this is a malignant cell and this is more benign. So the malignant nuclei are going to have irregular nuclear contours. So you can see the benign cell is very smooth. And then this irregular nuclear contour, that's going to be a sign of malignancy. And then the chromatin is going to be clumped, uneven, or vesicular. You can think like a boulder or a raisin versus a robin's egg for the benign. And another feature for benign, the cells are often, the cells and the nuclei are often gonna look similar to their neighbors. So you'll see a lot of similar looking cells next to one another. Whereas you're gonna have pleomorphism or just a term for variation in the size and the shape of cells in malignant entities. So we can really see that demonstrated here. Um, this benign entity on the left, you can see has this what is commonly referred to as honeycomb appearance or picket fence, glandular architecture. And they're really behaving themselves. They're similar to their neighbors and nothing too worrisome, just at low power first glance. The cells are very polarized and clustering together nicely. Whereas in the malignant process, you can have this irregular or drunken architecture or they can be tightly packed together. But contrasting to this benign, honeycomb, well-behaved appearance, you can see this drunken architecture, everything's kind of random, a little tipsy, stumbling over one another, and uh, totally different than what we see with the benign process. So not only are the nuclei and the chromatin features, but we can just look at the architecture, right? If it's behaving, it's more benign and more disorderly, it's gonna be a sign of malignancy. As far as nucleoli are concerned, in benign processes, they're usually going to be small or inconspicuous nuclei, nucleoli, and rarely you'll see mitotic figures, versus in a malignant process, you're going to have large, prominent nucleoli and a lot of mitoses, and some of those mitoses can be very atypical, as we see here. You typically aren't going to have nuclear molding in a benign process, whereas 
a malignant process such as small cell carcinoma or other entities, you will see that nuclear molding. And what that is is the nuclei of these cells are just molding or crowding into each other and kind of overlapping. So when you start seeing that, they're not the cells aren't really socially distancing properly or allowing um, space between each other, you would start to think more of a malignant process. And regarding the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, in benign entities, you're gonna have a low nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. So you're gonna have a lot of cytoplasm and the nuclei are gonna be a lot smaller. Whereas in malignant processes, you're gonna have a very high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. So you're gonna have more nucleus than you are cytoplasm. And for those of you that have seen pap smears or seen HSIL, for example, the, that's a good way of explaining it because in H cell you're going to have a very high nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, whereas like ASCUS or L cell, the nucleus is going to be a, a lot smaller and you're going to have more cytoplasm. So whenever you get a specimen in cytology, you're going to start working it up, right? And to categorize that, he has this uh, outline here where you can use this basic broad classification and figure out which bucket does this diagnosis go into? Is it epithelial or is it a carcinoma? Or is it more lymphoid like a lymphoma or mesenchymal like a sarcoma? Or could it even be melanoma, which seems to be able to pop up really anywhere. So if you know it's epithelial, you can then subclassify that even further into adenocarcinoma, squamous cell and neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine carcinomas. And a lot of that's going to be done with IHCs, which I'm not going to dive too much into IHCs in this video. It's just a brief overview, um, just to go over some of the cytology basics. Because once we know the basics of anything, that's going to make us better to um, better able to build on that foundational knowledge and get to more advanced levels and um, really just build upon the, the basic foundation. So. Epithelial cells or carcinoma form structures so even when smeared, they often remain in cohesive clusters. As you see here, you kind of see these cohesive areas even on a smear. And compared to blood cells, they're also relatively large in size, epithelial cells are. And they often have moderate to abundant cytoplasm. Obviously not true of all carcinomas, and he makes a joke, I'm looking at you, small cell carcinoma. So small cell can behave as it wants to and often have that nuclear molding, which is something that you'll learn to pick up on as time goes on. So here's are some examples of what a carcinoma may look like cytologically. So an adenocarcinoma, Adeno meaning gland, so it may form glands or papilla. And adenocarcinomas characteristically produce mucin, which may be visible in the cytoplasm. So here we see this intracytoplasmic lumina, and you can see this little mucin uh, vacuole here. And the cytoplasm often appears delicate, fluffy to granular, with less distinct cell borders, uh, a bluish cytoplasm on pap usually and is often columnar with nucleus polarized at one end and you can see signet ring cells. With squamous cell carcinoma, it's gonna produce keratin and this bright orangish on pap stain and you can often see keratin pearls. So just because you see orange doesn't mean that it's squamous cell carcinoma, but it can be associated with that diagnosis. Um, and the cytoplasm often appears dense with a distinct cell border. Moving on to neuroendocrine cells and neuroendocrine tumors. So the classic salt and pepper chromatin is the name for the nucleus and you can see this salt and pepper uh, neuroendocrine type chromatin here and that's going to be a tip off that you're working with something in the neuroendocrine category. And those cells are often discohesive, meaning that they don't stick together, they often separate, 
Um, and there are other entities that do that, such as uh, lymphomas. So lymphocytes on cytology are often also discohesive, meaning they like to keep their space, which I respect. Speaking of lymphoma, um, as previously mentioned, these are also often discohesive small cells. And they often have a scant cytoplasm um, and you can see lymphoglandular bodies or pieces of lymphocyte cytoplasm that peel off during, during smearing, which is what these arrows are pointing at. Lympho little lymphoglandular bodies. And if you think it could be a lymphoma, if you're at an adequacy, um, what you would want to do is put some of that material into RPMI to preserve those cells so you can send them for flow cytometry. Because flow cytometry is an incredibly valuable tool that's going to help um, the hematopathologist or whichever pathologist gets the uh, specimen to work up that lymphoma and see which CD markers uh, it is expressing and help categorize uh, the lymphoma. Of course, for better prognosis and management um, for the patient. Moving on to melanoma. So melanocytes, so melanoma is a malignant process of melanocytes, which are large discohesive cells and they're often very cellular aspirates. Um, they frequent ha frequently have prominent nucleoli or this double mirror image nuclei or demon eyes or bug eyed demons which you can kind of see here what would look like maybe demon eyes or um, something like that and if you see that you're going to start thinking potentially melanoma and the red arrow is pointing to cytoplasmic mel melanin pigment and the other the black arrow here is something you can see in melanoma which is intranuclear pseudo inclusions we'll talk a little bit ab about that later a little bit more the next process is mesenchymal or sarcomas. So mesenchymal processes are often composed of spindled cells, which can really be a tough bucket to land in, to be honest. Uh, spindled cell processes are very complicated. Uh, well, most things are complicated for me as a second year pathology resident. I have a lot to learn, but even for more seasoned pathologists, uh, spindled cell malignancies can be very difficult to work up just because they all look somewhat similar often on H&E and you kind of have to rely on various IHCs to work through different algorithms to try to narrow that diagnosis down and uh, get to a final diagnosis but spindled cells are long narrow cells with relatively scant cytoplasm and cigar like nuclei which is what you're seeing here these cigar-like nuclei and they almost look like they're being pulled out or the different ends of the nucleus are being pulled away from each other and they're kind of tapered and they frequently have an extracellular matrix and they can be very variable in their pleomorphism and other aspects so some common non-neoplastic findings are the first one is an abscess so in an abscess, um, you're going to see abundant neutrophils because that's really what an abscess is, right? It's a kind of an agglomerate or a combination of neutrophils in a place that was previously injured or these neutrophils are combining to try to recover or heal a, an infection or trauma or something like that. You can have necrosis and fibrin, macrophages, bacteria, foreign material, and at the time of adequacy, you can often see frank pus. If this happens, remember to get a culture. And clinically, the area is going to be warm, red, and tender. Because remember, our, uh, some of our foundational aspects of pathology, that rubor, color, and tumor, what, what all that is, that redness and that heat, is those cells, our body responding to an infection or responding to a trauma to the skin, and that's our body trying to heal itself. So that's just what we're able to see under the microscope when you look at an abscess. Moving on, so you can also get granulomas, 
Um, obviously, there are certain entities that granulomas are associated with, like TB, fungal infections, sarcoidosis, or even foreign materials like sutures and other things can cause a granuloma. And a granuloma is just a nodular collection of epithelioid histiocytes, often in loose syncytial aggregates, and they can resemble a swirling school of fish, which is what we see here. And the histiocytes may be spindled or epithelioid with elongated nuclei resembling bananas or boomerangs. Necrosis is another non-neoplastic finding that can be seen, and that's gonna have lots of grungy particle fragments and fibrin without any nucleated cells. And this can be seen in non-neoplastic processes and neoplastic processes. So look around for viable cells to suggest what might have caused it. You may see macrophages trying to clean it up. You can also have reactive lymphoid hyperplasia, and that's gonna be often a very cellular aspirate. And it's gonna be a mixture of small and large lymphocytes with the predominance of small lymphocytes. And you're frequently gonna have plasma cells and tangible body macrophages, which is what this red arrow is pointing to here, tangible macrophages. And you may see mitoses, and this is another process that you're gonna to wanna to consider sending for flow cytometry. So you're gonna to wanna to put those cells into RPMI to preserve them and then send them to the flow cytometry lab. So pretty much anything that is predominantly lymphoid in its makeup, you're not gonna really be able to tell for sure um, at first glance, especially like at an adequacy or something like that, whether it's lymphoma or whether it's a reactive lymphoid process. So if you're seeing what you think to be predominantly lymphocytes, try to make sure you get at least some cells or one pass um, to be able to put that in RPMI to send for flow cytometry. Some other things you can see are cyst fluid. So cyst fluid is posicellular with scattered macrophages, which may contain hemosiderin pigment. And you may see scattered debris. So these are some pictures of cyst fluid. And another thing that may come up on the rise or boards or in practice is ultrasound gel. So ultrasound gel is coarsely granular metachromatic material on Romanowski stains. And it can obscure the diagnostic material. And here, these red arrows are pointing to ultrasound gel. So lastly, we're just gonna go over some differential diagnoses to include, and then we'll wrap up here with our cytology basics episode. So intranuclear pseudo inclusions, in my mind, I most commonly associate them with papillary thyroid carcinoma or PTC. So what are they? They're, well, that's what you're looking at here, an intranuclear pseudo inclusion. And it develops when the cytoplasm pushes into the nucleus. And he makes the great reference of a balloon within a balloon. So remember on cyto, we're looking at two dimensional representations of these three dimensional cells or three dimensional structures. Um, I had a teacher the other day talk about imagine like a bubble in a, in a loaf of bread. And if you cut that in half, you're only going to see, you're going to be looking down into that bubble and it's going to look similar to what this intranuclear pseudo inclusion would look like. And I thought that was a really good teaching point and a good way to think about it. But some other entities you can see intranuclear pseudo inclusions in include medullary thyroid carcinoma, melanoma, uh, benign and malignant hepatocytes from the liver, meningiomas, and adenocarcinomas of the lung. So another differential, if you have very granular cytoplasm, that could be a granular cell tumor, acinar cell carcinoma, oncocytic or herthal cell neoplasms, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, could be a tumor composed of hepatocytes, melanoma, adrenal cortical tumors, and lytic cell tumors. And this tigroid background 
can be seen with glycogen-rich lesions, most commonly the seminoma or the dysgerminoma. They like to test on that for whatever reason on the rise. Um, so be aware of the tigroid background associated with seminomas. But you can also see it with clear cell renal cell carcinoma, Ewing sarcoma, and other glycogen-rich tumors. And lastly, the classic somoma bodies. Very pretty to look at, these concentric circles, frequently seen in papillary tumors. So again, you can see these in papillary thyroid carcinomas along with those pseudo-nuclear um, inclusions. And you can also see somoma bodies with serous ovarian tumors, mesotheliomas, papillary renal cell carcinomas, meningiomas, somatostatinomas, prolactinomas, and lung micropapillary adenocarcinomas. So that's it. This uh, was again based on Kurt's notes, the Cytology Basics PDF, and it looks like he based it on the Book of Cells by Dr. Richard McDeme. And so thank you again to Kurt's notes. Um, I'm going to put a link to that website and I hope you all check it out. It is packed full of excellent documents like this that are beautifully organized with great images. And thanks again. I hope you all enjoyed. If so, like and subscribe.